So between our, uh, all of us on our team, we engage in ministry um, and support ministry with those in the first third of life. And so, like Matt said, I'm in the um, serve the Pacific Mountain Regional Council, which is BC, Yukon, and Banff. And my pronouns are she and her. And I come to you from the traditional and unceded land of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Semiamu, Kwatlin, Katsi, Wasnik, and Stolo people who speak the Hunkaminam language. So I. Uh, have been a part of the United Church for, for some time and involved uh, in terms of camping ministry. My experience has been pretty extensive with a, a group called Camp Spirit. Pamela um, Evans is a part of that group as well. And that's day camping experiences for children and youth uh, in partnership with local congregations. So um, I was thinking back to last year, we were able to run camp and it was completely outside on the grass and um, that was quite the learning experience. And myself as a child, I was raised in a camping and fishing family. And uh, my experience specifically, I don't know if anyone out here on the coast uh, knows of a camp called Camp Farrier. I spent two weeks in Camp Farrier as a child, uh, extremely formative sleepover camps uh, when I was eight and nine years old. And then myself and experiencing of camp with my young girls and being a part of Camp Furcom and other camps in the Lower Mainland as my girls were raised, um, being raised up in the United Church. So, so like Matt said, my focus has been on children, youth and family ministry and a passion for nurturing children's spirituality and people of, of all ages, actually, but definitely a focus on children. And I was thinking about faith formation in our camps, which was the original topic. And I thought, you know, we come we're diverse in our United Church camps and how we live out faith formation, how we engage in it. It depends on our traditions of our, our camps and the leadership and the space. And I thought, well, what's an even bigger, more relevant um, to all of us? I was thinking of nurturing children's spirituality and how might we really make this um, on our on our um, planning level of how it informs our planning. How do we nurture children's spirituality um, more deeply than maybe we already do? And so this, the content that I want to share with you, it comes from Rebecca and I and a bit, a bit from Dave Sinas, who's um, Rebecca is a, a doctor, a psychologist in the UK. She's a godly play trainer and storyteller and has focused a lot of her work on nurturing children's spirituality. And then Dave Sinis is focused on practical theology and ministry with children, youth, and families. And he's a professor, assistant professor at um, Atlantic School of Theology. So I was thinking of spirituality, and I have some slides I'll take us through. I'll pop us out of the slides. Um, I'll have a, a question for the group, and then we'll go back into some more slides, and then we'll close with thoughts and questions. But please speak up at any time pause, get me to stop um, if you have some questions or um, comments even. So I'm going to start with slides. And the slides were present, so I'll get them back again. There we go. There they are. So thinking of um, starting with definitions, um, spirituality can, there's many definitions of spirituality out there. There are definitions from theologians, from educators, from psychologists, and in everyday life. And so this one in particular comes from Rebecca and I, after she had um, one of her children, she was thinking about this and wrote down, spirituality is delighting in all things, being absorbed in the present moment, not to attach to self, eager to explore boundaries of beyond and other, searching for meaning, discovering purpose, open to more, question mark. And another one from Rabbi Hugo Grin. Spirituality is like a bird. If you hold it too closely, it chokes. If you hold it too loosely, it flies away. 
Fundamental to spirituality is the absence of force. Defining spirituality is difficult because it is something that cannot be contained in words. And you can tell by the how many are out there for definitions. It's, it's true. It is something that we feel. It's nonverbal insights. It involves sound and touch and so much more. Those are just few offerings, uh, two offerings of a definition of uh, spirituality, and then specifically children's spirituality. We can think as Christians, and that's something we have all have an identity of a Christian um, community, camping community, in the context of our United Church of Canada. As Christians, we can define children's spirituality as God's way, uh, ways of knowing with, of being with children, and children's ways of being with God. And so I thought that we could focus, I could focus some time on uh, some aspects of children's spirituality, uh, some ways of of remembering um, what it is we've seen in our time with children, what do we know, and then also uh, ways that we can support children's ways of being with God and how they connect with God. So Rebecca and I goes through and she talks of children's spirituality, some aspects of them. They are in the everyday. Their spirituality doesn't just happen in any particular time or place. It happens in the everyday moments of children's lives. And they can easily move from the deep and profound statements, engagements to the everyday ordinary. That's just as deep and profound for them, but maybe not for us. And so because of that, they can also be described as being erratic. They can move so quickly uh, between those deep comments and thoughts to what is going on in their immediate, to what's going on in their universe, their toys, the food that they had for lunch. Another aspect of children's spirituality is that it's verbal and nonverbal. So children, we remember, um, often don't. Uh, engage in expressing things with their words till much later in life. They know so much, but they don't know how to articulate it just yet. And we know as adults that children um, express things through nonverbal interactions. And we can see that in our, uh, as well as adults as well, nonverbal um, expressions on our faces, our body position, and to remember that their spirituality is expressed through nonverbal ways. And it's very deep. Children come to us into this world with a deep connection to the holy. And sometimes as adults, we can forget that. Children's spirituality is integrated, integrated into every aspect of their life, all that they do and say. And it's not compartmentalized. It's something that children don't naturally do is compartmentalization. So we see that spirituality integrated into everything. And it can be so surprising. At the most interesting moments, children and youth can come up with so many deep and profound statements and engaging. And sometimes that surprises us. It happens in the most maybe inopportune times or unexpected times, like standing beside each other and washing the dishes or going for a drive, or you're doing something that's so unrelated and the child comes out and says something deep and profound about God, about the world, about creation. And sometimes children's spirituality can be challenging to us, especially when their imagination is engaged It's so present and clear. And sometimes that imagination can feel challenging to us, depending on the context and when and where children um, speak and engage in their spirituality. And finally, we need to remember that children's spirituality is endangered. Children, um, much of our lives have become programmed and scheduled. And so there's, they're missing time and space to engage, to focus to be present in the present moment. And I think that's something that our our camps can provide children, provides us an ability to be focused in the moment. That's a precious thing. 
So in a way to um, get a little bit deeper into children's spirituality and how we can support them, I would like to take a few moments and invite you to think about your own childhood, to go back to a time when you were younger. And did you have a favorite toy or game or way of spending time? And how did it make you feel? So I invite you to take a moment to think about that, to write it down. The time when you were younger, where you had a favorite toy, game, or way of spending time, and how did it make you feel? And after a minute, I'll invite, I'll, I'll leave this, I'll invite us into a, um, a time of sharing, if you feel so called. It's uh, Kathy Amashita here. You wanted us to speak? If you, if you have an answer right away, definitely, please share. Um, if, I, if I remember times uh, when I was a child and I had a lot of thinking and feeling happening, it was when I was alone. And I grew up on a farm and I'd just wander around and, uh, uh, and in exploring the topography of the farm, I think that you, you think about uh, where, do, where do I come from and what am I here for and what am I doing? And, um, and every Sunday we were in Sunday school, so we had that teaching. But it's times when I was alone and just wandering that it seemed. Uh, and that was rare, actually, because I had three younger brothers and sisters to take care of. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. Feel free to unmute and share if you'd like. For myself, I think of when I was younger, we used to live on the outskirts of town and there was a, a wooded area close to our house and just going down there and being out in nature. Um, I used to find that very peaceful, I guess spiritual in a way, particularly in the winter when I would go cross country skiing through the, through the bush, we used to call mm. it bushwhacking, but it was always so quiet and it was just a very peaceful kind of time. Mm. Thank you, Rick. When I was young, I like quite young, I really liked to play with my Fisher Price Little People sets. So you had your farm, your camper, and the school bus, and the circus, and the there was a boat, and there these I had them all until about five years ago, um, and I, th th there was just so much imaginative play that was done through that and it also helped you like role play relationships and caring for others and caring for animals because there was the farm and there was the, the circus um but it really made me feel like anything was possible mm -hmm. and that you could really expand your horizons um if you took the time to do so mm -hmm. thank you joe Kathy, did you have your, yeah? Uh, I just think of the very important times were when I was laughing or crying. Um, yeah, and, mm -hmm. and it was usually in relationships to other people, like, and those were, they felt like deep. Mm -hmm. Music too. Oh, music. Oh, music. Thank you, Kathy. Colleen? You know, what I think about it, I did a lot of like cleaning and organizing and setting things into like where they needed to be. So like my grandparents had this like trailer that didn't get used very much anymore. And I would spend hours of time when I was at the farm, just like organizing it and cleaning it and making it seem like a home and all of this stuff. And I was like 10. So I'm not surprised that I manage things now. <laughs> Thank you, Colleen. Bria? Uh, yes, I was just uh, remembering um, times we went often out to our aunt's camp and Lake Superior 
uh, she was on Lake Superior and the force of nature at different times, whether it was quiet and peaceful or roaring in, but that that feeling of cons constant replenishing or constantly coming back, I always found that very peaceful. Mm. Thank you, Ria. I found personally a lot of um, peace. I would, um, my favorite time, pastime for a while when I was a child was going out to the river and there was this fallen log and I was able to um, catch um, and watch minnows hanging out and little ones. And I spent a lot of time laying on that log, uh, watching the river flow. Oh, and then also the, the little minnows that would um, be there in the spring, especially. And for me, that was, um, a time of, I've heard someone else say, a quiet and peace, and there was um, a reliance on nature that I understood, uh, and uh, yeah, just time to process what was going on in my head. Anyone else who would like to share before we move on? Well, it's Lorraine here. Lorraine, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Sorry, I was a little bit late. I'm thinking uh, my mother died when I was fairly young and my favorite, she was a phenomenal gardener and my favorite place growing up on a farm in Saskatchewan was that she had a, gar a flower garden that my father put a fence around so the chickens couldn't get in. And I would sometimes lay in the path of that flower garden and just watch, uh, watch the flowers and feel the peace. Mm. Thank you, Lorraine. Anyone else who'd like to share? Thank you for sharing. So I'll move back to the slides and what I'd like to share with you. Um, and you know, this might be something that you've already engaged in, in terms of, actually I should just ask, has anyone, I'm taking a lot of stuff um, rooted in this book, uh, this is the book by Rebecca Nye, Children's Spirituality, What Is It and Why It Matters. This has, hands up, have you read this one before? A few. So you've, you've been through these. This is a great book to take a team through and processing. Um, and I always come back to it each time I'm in planning um, because there's certain aspects of it. You can't do it all at once. So just bit by bit, what part am I working on now? So if you've um, engaged in this book before, hopefully that you'll find a piece that you will um, take with you today and maybe take into your planning for the summer. So I will share my screen. And oh, didn't do what I asked it to do, like go from where I was left at. There we go. So uh, Rebecca and I, she's um, pulled out, uh, given us the acronym of SPIRIT. And these are general principles, uh, ways that you can use um, take stock of how it is that you are supporting children's spirituality in your camping, in your ministry, kind of like a checklist. And so I'll just um, go through each of the ones briefly, and then um, we'll move into the four ways of knowing God. So first, we have space. Space. We're talking about physical space. Questions around, is it clean, well lit? What kind of material is in it? These kinds of things affect children's ability to be in the space, to do the activities that we're asking them to do. Um, do we have the materials that are um, engaging, that are appropriate for children? And they really make a difference um, in letting uh, children know that the space is for them and they're welcome there. So we pay attention to space, also to process. It's become um, more popular in a Christian education and faith formation is process, um, but a lot of what we do in this world is ends products oriented. Show us a result. Bottom line is what, what is the product? What's the result? And process is not that. Process is focusing on how we get there, the journey. The journey being important, um, not the destination. And so when we're working with children, um, it's important to recognize the times when we're focused on 
on what is being produced, maybe it's that's a valid way of engaging. We are creating something that is going to be shown to others. It's being produced, um, but it's important to discern, discern our times of the process and product oriented. The process allows um, our children, ourselves, to really be present in the moment, to uh, rest in the moment, things like our worship and our prayers, our spiritual processes. They're not an ends to themselves. And so we want to pay attention to those aspects in our ministry, in our camping ministry. Imagination. And it's important for people of any age, for the ability to wonder, to be creative, to engage in what if, what about, what could be, going deeper and adapting and creating. Imagination is a rich source to uncover what it means to live out the kingdom of God here on earth. And relationship. Beginning with ourselves as leaders, as ministers, what kind of relationship do we have with the holy? And we need to be working on that. All our leaders need to be working on it, have some semblance of what that means before we're working and supporting others in their relationship. And so how do we create space um, that where children can engage in relationship with each other that's safe, um, that's brave? How can we support and work in ways that they can engage and um, be in relationship with the holy. And next comes intimacy. And so when we talk about process and stability and imagination, and then our relationships, then the next level is the intimate knowing that God knows us before we were born. And it's important that um, we know in our hearts of, of that intimate awareness and that that happens with children and children have an intimate relationship with the holy. So what do we do? How can we support that really deep um, connection to the holy? And through that is trust, a result of the in intimacy that takes a long time to build and to be aware that it can be easily broken. And you think about the, maybe the short time you have with children, we have with them in a week of camp. Um, and sometimes trust takes a long time to build, but sometimes when we pay attention to the space, nonverbal ways of being, perhaps that trust can be earned quite quickly. Children can rely on us and it can happen in, in a space of a couple of days. And we think about also, the children that come back to us year after year and that trust that can be built, seeing the same leaders again and again, and those children growing up and wanting to become leaders in training. And there's that level of trust that keeps them coming back and coming back and staying um, and becoming leaders themselves. And to end these spirits, um, to remember to, to follow the lead of children that sometimes our young people in our lives have a lot to teach us. And like Jesus, we can welcome the children in and let them teach us. So just I'll, um, if anyone wants a copy of the slides, I won't take time to unpack this in the group right now, but just to, to remember that these pieces are always something that we're working on and maybe we're, work, we're strong in one place and not as strong in the other. So what aspects of of uh, supporting these general principles of supporting children's spirituality is strongest in your ministry? And what aspects might you strengthen? There's always something at work that we need to work on and become more aware of as, as each summer moves on or each season um, comes to us. So spirit. Before I go to the next slide, where any comments? Thoughts? I'm going the wrong way. Okay, so just the last piece of slides. Uh, so from uh, two pieces of work, um, one is Corrine Ware's Spirituality Wheel, a spiritual type selector, and then Dave Sinis's Four Ways of Knowing God. To remember that 
we all have ways of engaging in our relationship that become that come naturally to us with the holy and we enter in in a certain spot and um, we develop other ways but we have the four ways that dave has articulated in his study with uh, children and their spirituality and one is head very head spirituality word oriented folks um, a second one is heart spirituality emotion centered um, we enter in in the emotion and then there's mystical spirituality, symbol, and social action spirituality, where we have action. And it's important to remember um, that children have these ways of knowing God. And how do we remember this in our programs, in our camping? How do we um, live this, all these areas out? And maybe we can't. And that's that's reality, uh, but to to know where uh, where we're centered, and maybe where we can encourage um, other ways of engaging with the holy, um, that allows um, the variety of people that come to us and are in our ministry engage. So I've pulled out some best practices uh, for each of the four areas. So head spiritualities practices that nurture word centered children and youth. Focusing on the Bible, but not being limited to the Bible. Encouraging our young people to read the Bible and using it as a mirror for their own lives to inform, inform, form, and transform. A place where we can start to make meaning um, and uh, be, go deeper. Um, it, it's helpful to be aware of human development, the stages of cognitive development, faith formation, um, what language, uh, how we make meaning at the different ages of our life. It's important to avoid dumbing down, uh, to make accessible language, use accessible language, but not dumbing it down. And encouraging co-learners and welcoming questions, ways to um, help nurture those who are word-centered. Next is heart-centered spirituality, practices that nurture those who come in through emotion. Don't be limited by fads. <laughs> Music uh, that children listen to in their congregations can help have considerable impact on them in years to come. Expose them to different styles, and I know camp is really rooted. There's often traditional music but don't forget about the lyrics because the lyrics are important for those who are focused and centered in the heart uh, it can help or hinder their connection to god those lyrics so paying attention to those i'm sure you've done this before create new lyrics to a familiar tune help them make their own music encourage them to go beyond music into dance drama other forms of art and make room for uh, including children and youth in our times of worship and praise. And I know that's something that we, we do quite well in our com camping communities, but just to remember uh, to seek out ways for uh, younger people to engage in leadership and worship. Mystical spirituality practices that nurture symbol-centered children and youth. Praying matters keep things open. Oh, we're good at uh, getting back to nature, paying attention to pace and volume, nurturing a sense of mystery, reverence, and awe. Symbols and rituals are a key way for symbol-centered children and youth to engage in their relationship with God. And lastly, social action spirituality practices that nurture those that are action oriented providing opportunities to meet people to get to know them to hear their story to do this gradually to do it in community and so 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 important to offer space for reflection what just happened where was god there how was god present in meeting the people, doing the work? How is the, our faith story, the story of our faith, of our lives, connected to the people that we're meeting and the work that we're doing? I will leave these slides now. 
and see the time and just ask you um, what comes up for you in uh, any either of the spirit or the um, four ways of knowing God. What stands out to you at this time? Robin? One of the things that's stood out for me in the four ways of knowing God is actually just how well we do that at camp. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's something that, that camp can do so thoroughly. Um, and I think about our, our chapel times where we have symbols and, you know, we really nurture that, that aspect. And then, and then we have the times where we're cleaning the washrooms and they're your service, your action and the singing at campfire and the skits and, you know, just all of the stuff that, that, that we do so well. And, and yeah, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity that we have at camp. It's mm -hmm. like no other place. I hear that you're being affirmed in what you're doing, Robin, based on what I just shared. So let's, I feel it too. Thank you for sharing. Pix? Uh, I'm just, I'm thinking about uh, how all of this is great for children, but I think it's so great for our counselors and our program coordinators as well. So yeah. uh, lots of this to share with them, because I think, I think sometimes our young people come to get this this job, especially when it's a new job for them, and they think they have to make some kind of a connection with church. Uh, yes, you know, I went to church when I was little or whatever, instead of, you know, helping to affirm that they're in church in the woods, you know, that they're in church when they're in relationship. And so I think lots of this will be really helpful for, for our uh, staff as well. Thank you. Good Thank to see you, you again. I was thinking the same thing as I was going through this is that it's so important for our, our staff and uh, giving them language and understanding pics of what it means to, to be um, connected to the holy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Doug, were you going to say something? Yeah, I'm um, I, I, agreeing with Robin and pics. Uh, that was part of what I was going to say. But one of the things that struck me about the four areas was I had myself placed in them. And then when you show detail about each one, I realized how much I was in all of them to an extent. So when we're dealing with people, there's a whole bunch of different ways to, to deal with them. And most people come in set that they do things this way, but don't realize the whole spectrum and how, how maybe versatile they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so important to note where you land and then how you plan or engage. And uh, yeah, really important to be aware of that. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else notice what stood out, Colleen and then Lorraine? Yeah, I just, um, I guess the thing that was that stood out for me was uh, so we've had this really odd thing happen this year where we kind of renamed our faith programming and we call it live out loud. Now. And I suddenly had this wealth of applicants who wanted to be involved in leading that programming. Um, and I'm looking at all these, I've been looking at these applications and what they're putting forward and their ideas for programs in that area and we've got such a balance of all these different like I have some people who want to make uh, rosaries and I have others who want to teach about disability justice and I have another one that wants to paint in the woods and I'm just like well we'll do it all <laughs> like we'll just do all of it because that's fantastic um and I just like, it's really neat to see that like these young people are just so alive in their spirit, like how they 
want to express their spiritualities Mm -hmm. and just seeing those four different pieces I'm like we need to I need to articulate this better with them so that they see how like they see their spirituality as dynamically as I do when Mm -hmm. I'm looking at this and going wow this is this is extremely exciting Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you Colleen yeah it is Lorraine Hey, well, I was thinking about at McKenzie Camp, we usually have our campfire, and then um, they walk to the chapel carrying a light into the chapel area, and how important that, uh, that song that, that we sing on the way to the chapel is, and then walking out again in silence, mm. and how uh, spiritual that is, I mean, as well as singing and playing when you do dishes and everything else and I'm also thinking so if we have uh, camp this summer how are we going to do that and space out I just uh, anyhow yeah that's a whole level of complication yeah I mean we're, we're looking at uh, maybe doing camp uh, family gatherings so every cabin every family has a cabin mm-hmm. but how how would you do that anyhow it's lots to think about <laughs> Very rich. Yes, lots. Kathy Douglas? I think Harry had his hand up first. Harry, uh, then Kathy. Harry first. Okay. Uh, okay. okay, there we go. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm looking at this from a slightly different perspective. Uh, most of our kids are coming to us because they've been beaten down by Christianity in the church. And for me, when I look at camps looking at becoming affirming, it's going to be a very thin, a thin line to be able to talk to them and still be able to, and I'm not, put, not trying to um, put everybody in the same box, but what we see is we have to be very, very careful um, because of the, the, uh, I won't say harassment, but just, just the general negativity of being gay or whatever yeah. with, with uh, in a Christian background, no matter where you're coming from. Yeah. And if you have kids that are coming to an affirming camp, most likely they're United Church camp kids or United Church kids, which is, makes it a little bit different. Mm-hmm. But I, what I don't see in any of the, the circles or whatever is... Um, forgiveness from God. No, no, sorry, that's quite kind of the wrong way, but being, being able to speak on behalf of the organization or the church and, and, and asking for forgiveness of how we've treated them. Mm. And I don't see that anywhere. All I see is us building it up rather than having to tear it down first and coming to their level and bringing them up. Mm. And um, it's just an observation um, mm-hmm. and to find counselors um, that uh, can work with our youth at that at that would be amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we try very we work on the whole we allow the whole spiritual thing and they can and they can uh, we we can't do we can't do a, a chapel we can't do a chapel uh, because you're going to exclude some and so forth and so forth. Mm-hmm. But it would certainly be nice if we could have uh, people to come to camp for the one week that we when when we have it or or some way of being able to. I'll say professionally, be able to work with these kids that want to be, and just just let them know that there's there's a lot more out there than what they've experienced. Mm-hmm. So that that informs like that awareness in in all of this, how we engage in spirituality, the hurt that's been caused, and that big picture that's missing from what I've just shared. Thank you, Harry, for sharing that. Very relevant, Kathy. Yeah, I'm, uh, thanks, Harry, because I was kind of going to that sort of space. Mm-hmm. With it, I don't want to call it the elephant in the room, but certainly when we're talking about faith and, and uh, tradition, it's such a gamut of, of what comfort level people have. But I, I, but I can't help but say our United Church camps, this could be the only place a kid does hear about God and does hear about love and divine and Jesus. And having sort of the, it does need to be somewhat professional. Like there does need to be, and I don't know if that's the right term, not that it 
like you don't have everything as well. Like you don't need professional people to teach spirituality or whatever professional might mean, but deep love and um, inclusion and naming some of the scripture, you know, where, where in our tradition, because we're a United Church camp, like we're a church, so we're Christian, mm-hmm. but being able to name it and hopefully if they've been hurt by it in a way that it's, they hear it in new ways mm-hmm. that they can say, oh, this tradition that's in my life might offer me something mm-hmm. to move on. So it, it, yeah, the whole, we can't not talk about this stuff. Mm-hmm. without saying where are we on the balance of it thank you Kathy mm. any other thoughts on, on on being informed in this way specifically in supporting LGBTQ plus youth children picks um I was just interested to hear uh, Harry talk about camps becoming affirming. Uh, We haven't officially gone into a process and I'm not sure we even thought of that, Harry. So thanks for even using those words, but we've just tried to be much more specific in our language. Um, For instance, our applications, it specifically says we accept applications from all genders, all faiths, all orientations. Um, You know, we fly the rainbow flag. We uh, try to make it overt in our welcome, I guess is the way. And I've I've already had, you know, so we had two summers ago, a young person who was working with us and came out to the rest of the staff. And this was the first place that he had come out and couldn't believe it that, you know, a church camp was the safe place for him, you know? So, Mm -hmm. I mean, I just find those things really uh, encouraging and inspiring and all of that for all of us. And I think, I think our young people who are the staff uh, maybe have a much better handle on that welcome than some of the folks that are in our churches, you know, mm. but uh, so we can just, I think we can just live into that kind of welcome, you know, so this year we have a trans person who's on our staff and we have uh, somebody who wants to be a CIT who's just come out as non-binary, you know, like I'm just being kind of wonderfully excitedly blown away by that you know in our little camp in PEI um, as a as a person who has been in a same gender relationship for over 20 years you know I'm just like yeah you know and so we've uh, connected with our local uh, organization in PEI Peers Alliance who works with youth and adults but I mean we've connected with them through their youth programming and they're going to come and join us for our staff training so you know, I just, it just feels like a breath of fresh air. Uh, and, and, uh, I think it's, it's a wonderful, uh, open door, which we really, you know, it just took a few conversations around our board table. It took me saying, what about this language on our application? And everybody said, oh yeah, that's good. You know, mm-hmm. and what about we fly a flag? And, oh yeah. You know, and it, it just, it just was just needing somebody to, put it out there, you know, mm-hmm. so I think mm-hmm. we'll, you know, we'll work at it. We want to be ready, uh, you know, like Carrie said, for those, for those kids and youth who think maybe this isn't the place, we want them to feel right away, day one, this is the place you can be safe, you know, mm-hmm. so we do have such a fabulous uh, chapel, <laughs> You know, it's all one big chapel outdoors and uh, to, to invite them in. So, so thanks for bringing that up for us. Harry. Mm-hmm. Most definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Pex. Colleen? Yeah, so when I was, I was, so I started out as a chaplain at Manessa Tongue in 2017 and 2018. So my whole job was doing spiritual stuff and doing the faith programming and all that kind of stuff and I was in my master of divinity at the time and the campers and staff knew me as someone who was of the church Um, and I came out as a drag king to them because that's what I had been in university and I also told them that I was queer 
And I also told them that I had identified as pansexual um, at a time, but now identified as queer. And that more than anything opened doors for them to mm -hmm. see that like I was in the church, I was on my way to ordination and, and this was my identity. And I think like, honestly, I think more than any symbol or picture or statement I just like I was just as honest about myself as possible without it being like a boundary problem but like mm -hmm. I was just honest about who I am and I think like sometimes we don't want to share those kinds of details because we think that's going to get in the way uh, but I think being able to say you know I'm in the church and this is who I am I think that that was more powerful than anything else for them and then in terms of just like a resource piece, uh, I'm just going to just like shout out that Transplaining is doing spirituality uh, in camps on like March 23rd. Like they're doing a session on that as well uh, for LGBTQ kids. So that might be something that if if this is a topic of interest, they're, they're, they're on. <laughs> that was the guest person was the guest speaker. Uh, last, last time month? yeah yeah I was just yeah. hearing Vicky was sharing fantastic resource person Vicky oh I was just going to add like an actual thing that we do at our camp in our faith formation programming every single time um is we build an altar and this has happened for the last probably five years and so when we gather in what we call SCT we all have different names for like chapel um when we gather as a camp we build an altar with symbols that actually represent. So um, we have we have like a rainbow stole that we use as, as one of it. Actually, that's the last piece about um, welcome and, and we're explicit about that. But we also talk about the land that we're on and the fact that like it's there's so there's so many groups that have been disenfranchised and marginalized by Christian communities. Mm -hmm. So we took we have you know um, where we are in Southern Saskatchewan. So we have sage and we talk about Indigenous people that found this land sacred before we did and we have a cross and we talk about you know the people of faith who 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 decided to to build something here and we have water to talk about you know the land that we're stewarding and stuff and so we do that every single time we gather as a, like every single day at camp and I think um I don't know what kids think I think it's beautiful but I also think that for kids it's like it's like they're into it and then they're bored by it and then it becomes part of them <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like it yeah. actually moved through the like cycles of like, <laughs> so, and I think that's great because if a kid can walk away from a church camp and be able to have the language to share that, like, oh yeah, the, I go to this United church camp and they recognize that like the land was sacred before, you know, before a camp was ever there and they named the, you know, they named the people that were there and, and we do it every single day. So and I, anyways, I just think, like everything that people are sharing with pics shared and, and what Colleen shared is so good, but also like in your faith formation programming, just like having a thing where you say it every day mm -hmm. is like one way to, like Carrie said, tear it down as you build it up. And I was going to say in your circles, um, I think camps, I mean, I don't know, every camp's really different, but camps that I've been a part of are always really good at that mystical piece, like ritual, like listening to Lorraine talk about carrying the light from campfire to their chapel time. Like, that is those, that mystic ritualistic, those are the things that kids think about later. And it's, oh, yes. it provides them the, the grounding to like figure out where their spirit's going to grow after. So anyways, I think that I'm a big fan of ritual. And if people are interested, I can try to find the lang language we use. I mean, it's very Southern Saskatchewan specific, but building an altar is just like a simple way. So. Thank you, Vicki. Ritual, 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 repeat, definitely. I'm with you on that one. Yes, I think there's a, could you share Vicki, please? <laughs> I am just noticing the time. Uh, any other final comments before we close this, this time, focus time of conversation? Well, I just want to, I just want to add quickly, Mackenzie Camp is an affirming camp and, uh, and uh, we've been blessed with our, our uh, chaplain for the last little while, but um, I don't know how much time we've spent on that at our staff training because I'm not all a part of all of that. Mm -hmm. So that was a really important thing for all of you to bring up, Harry, 
and all of you. And the other thing I was thinking is um, we, uh, I don't know whether other camps, but we always apply for the Aboriginal grant and we always ensure that we have, try to have at least one Aboriginal uh, camp counselor and they, uh, so then they're visible. And so that, uh, so that's an important part of uh, who we are. And especially with the Splatchine band being right close to us and the, they, our children, their children come to our camp and so on. So mm -hmm. I'm pointing that out that there is a, there is a grant available for things like that. Mm, thank you, Lorraine. I was thinking of Camp Spirit as well and our training with our, our staff and um, spending the time on language and unpacking uh, language and how it can be uh, um, a block or an opening and how we engage in that and how, well, how we use our language with young people, children in our care and being inclusive. Uh, so we spend significant amount of times. Last couple of years, I think we've been focusing on that and going deeper. Pamela, did you want to say any more about that training? No? Okay. <laughs> but there's always more to work on, definitely. Any other final comments before I have a prayer to close our, our time together? Oh, thank you so much. There's We spend a lot of time. Um, an hour is not enough. 40 minutes is not enough. But uh, there's a lot. I've written down a lot for myself. So thank you. I feel uh, enriched in being in, spending this time with you all. I have a prayer uh, written um, by Christine Aron Sign called Let Your Life Speak. Let God's love speak to you of the wonder of who you are the beauty of who you are created to be. Let God's love speak to you of loyalty, generosity, and compassion, of tenderness and caring and trust. Let God's love speak to you of fun and food and fellowship and what it means to be a child of the living God. Let it remind, let it remind you that God's love is so wide and deep so all embracing that nothing can separate us from it. Amen. Amen. Thank you so very much, Mary, uh, for being here and for sharing and, 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 and allowing that conversation to happen. It's so great to have, uh, have people like you in the church who are leading us in this ministry. So on behalf of all of us, thank you. My pleasure. Um, folks, uh, just a few announcements. Um, just to remind you that we are meeting uh, next month on April the 12th. And that is the meeting where Carla Leon from, um, uh, from the new, uh, she's the new initiatives manager for Embracing the Spirit. Um, so she's gonna come in and talk, uh, talk grants, um, think about, different new ways to think about partnerships as well as some strategic planning stuff and new ways to think about revenue. So um, she's, uh, if you've never met Carla, I think if you haven't met Carla, you should. Um, and if you think that um, fire hose of information is um, a word that you might think about when you come to these meetings, it will be like a super powered fire hose of information that will literally come through your screen and um, like your brain will just hurt afterwards. So just be aware. Uh, and I'd say that with all much love, Carla is an amazing person who brings a lot of gifts. Um, and the beauty of what she does is she, if you've chatted with her, um, you, you know that when you leave a space with her, you're, you have so much energy and like, we can do it all. We can, and we can all do it right now. Um, so uh, I'd encourage you all to, um, to, to come to that if you haven't registered for that yet. Um, I do also want to mention that, um, and I'm going to put it in the chat here that the, um, I think many of us, we've talked about this um, before, but through the Outdoor Ministries Connection survey, um, the United Church, uh, we have now received, because we have, because we had more than 25 United Church, United Church camps fill out the survey. In fact, we had 45 of 55, um, which uh, I just, I just verified that um, 
uh, it's the lar- it's the largest percentage of any denomination in North America to have actually filled out the survey, which is pretty amazing since here you go, folks, only three years ago, two camps filled it out. So we have done a lot of work. And so the information that's in there is very fascinating. If you hadn't had a chance to look at it yet, um, uh, we pulled out a few sort of highlights, um, uh, things from last year. Now, of course, the, the questions are different, you know, last year because of 2020 and COVID and everything. Um, but some interesting things that you'll note, 40% of our camps saw lower donations than in 2019. Um, 71% of our camps had no in, on-site guests at all or programming at all. Um, uh, un, uh, 100% of our camp directors um, are white. Um, so that's something we need to work on um, uh, within our church uh, and within our camp community. Um, 6 54% of our camps have no full-time staff whatsoever. Um, uh, United Church Camps reported a $6.28 million loss last year as a combined total. Um, and so, uh, you know, like many, many organizations during COVID and uh, United Church Camps in Canada saw a 99% decrease in the number of campers from 2019. Um, because we didn't have any. Um, so, uh, and at least traditional summer camps. So take a look. It's really fascinating, um, some of the information that you'll, um, that you'll find in there. So I'd encourage you to go and take a look. Um, use it for your board um, to start part of sort of that, that planning piece as well. So that's just one thing that I did want to mention. Um, and um, I'm just wondering, uh, Mary, are you able to, some folks have asked, sent me a private saying, you'll be able to share the, the slides and you'll, yeah. get them, you'll get those over to Joe and I'm sure Joe will put them up on the website. Yes, I can make them a PDF and send them to Joe. Yeah, yes. Um, can I say one thing about, Sure. Um, uh, Pamela's reminded me of one of the things that First Third Ministry has been able to do is um, do faith at home kits and support faith in the homes. And one thing that we tried last year, we're going to do this year is camp at home. So if you're not able to, as camps, uh, engage in in-person camp or it's very limited, what we're doing is adding this as um, in support of camping at home in in your own place. So it could be that you could um, order them and add pieces that are specific to your camp and then send it out to your families or something thereof. So I'll just put the um, link to our resources in the chat. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, Vicki, was there anything else that we needed to bring up? Do you remember? No, we're great. Excellent. Um, it's so great to see you beautiful people. And um, I hope all is well. Take care of yourselves and each other, and we'll see you again soon.